And I, I call the MWPA Executive Committee meeting of October 7th to order. Allison, would you please call the roll? Nevada Fire District. Present. County of Marin. Present. City of Mill Valley. Here. Town of Ross. Town of Ross. Looks like Julie is frozen. Yeah. I'll move on to City of San Rafael. Here. And return to Town of Ross. Yeah, sorry, I'm having internet problems. I'm gonna to try to move. <laughs> the quorum is present with all five members. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, any requests to adjust the order of the agenda? And I'm seeing none. Uh, so this is the open time for public expression. Um, the public is welcome to address the executive committee this time on matters not, not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the committee. Please be advised that pursuant to government code, the government committee is not permitted to discuss or take any action on any matter not on the agenda. Comments be no longer than three minutes and should be respectful to the community and your cell phones, please turn them off and mute your microphone when, when not reporting out. Uh, any public expression here? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there is no public comment. Okay, okay, thanks all. Um, let's move on to Mark, please, the executive officer's report. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll start with a little bit of a fire update first. As you know, a couple of days ago, we had a couple of fires, one on White's Hill and one on Hawk Hill. I guess it was a day for fires on hills. But anyway, um, and when we have a couple of fires that are so close together in time, a lot of people want to think about arson. And while both fires are under um, investigation, um, arson's not indicated in both of these fires. Um, both were contained at relatively small sizes. Um, interesting thing is that the Hawk Hill, or excuse me, the White Hill fire, um, the Tam East, or excuse me, the Tam West camera was aimed right at it. And PG&E has had, um, they've added the artificial intelligence fire detection onto um, the cameras. And it, it did get a detection from the um, system. However, it was three minutes after 911, but it was on a roadside, on a busy, a, a frequently traveled road. So that, um, 911 calls are gonna come quickly through that. So, um, but it still is a pretty quick detection. And we are scheduled to meet with the artificial intelligence company um, tomorrow, in fact, to discuss um, ha having notifications being sent to Marin. Right now they're being sent to the control center for pg e and they don't necessarily always uh, share that, that notification to us. Um, but on the upside about pg e they are funding every one of the cameras that we have in Marin, and they're looking to fund more cameras in Marin. They've been a great partner. Um, just the way the artificial intelligence system works, we would have to subscribe to do that. And I do think that fits very cleanly into the JPA language. It's a flat out says fire detection is one of our, our um, charges. Um, but the, the, you know, the fires occurred on, um, on relatively mild fire weather days, and it just speaks to that we can have a fire any day, and it's just a matter of where the fire ignites and how far it's going to extend. Um, on a state update, there's three major fires, really, that are staffed by um, an incident management team. The Dixie Fire is uh, over 95% containment, so that's looking really good. Um, then we also have the river and then the Kings National Park Complex. And those are the ones that are threatening the, the sequoias. And I, I think we've mentioned that the fact that we have to defend sequoias um, really speaks to what the fire environment is right now. Those are uh, the sequoias and the redwoods are the most resilient trees to fire. And that we have to take these great efforts to, to protect them says what our environment is. Um, they have been relatively successful. They've, they have lost a few of the sequoias, which isn't good, but um, they are gaining ground on that. Um, and then, the, 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 one of the messages we've been trying to convey is we're in a little bit of a lull in fire season and we do not want anybody to drop their guard. We are entering into the most dangerous part of fire season. Right. And the, the weather pattern is we'll have a low pressure system come in. It cools the temperatures, maybe brings a little bit of rain and gets everyone thinking maybe fire season's over. But behind and in the fall, behind every low pressure system is going to be some form an offshore wind event. And it's just a matter of how strong that offshore wind event is. And right now, um, medium to short term uh, predictions are saying there could be an offshore wind event here in about a week. So we'll keep an eye on that. 
Um, moving on to MWPA business, uh, been working with Gene to coordinate our uh, strategic ad hoc meetings. Um, we have a slate of calendar dates set up. Uh, depending on the participation for the first meeting, we may have to pivot a little bit and push back two weeks so we can get the, the complete participation through it. But Gene's worked out a great agenda for each of the meetings, and I think um, we'll come out of the end with, a, with an awesome package. The website, very excited about the website right now, and we are looking to go live on October 21st at our next board meeting, or during our next board meeting is when we're going to go live. Uh, the MWPA team spent about six hours pouring through that website on Tuesday, um, adding uh, content, adding locations, and um, doing a QA. And so we're doing the final refinements, and we'll, um, like I said, we'll launch it on the 21st. Grant program is continuing to push forward um, the development of that. Charlotte's been working very hard, working with Momentum and our member um, agencies to get that online. We're going to schedule another meeting here real quick, just to touch bases with all the agencies that are going to be involved. And even if um, their local grant program isn't going to be involved through our platform, we still need to check with all the member agencies because there will be a check back with each of the member agencies for the DSpace and home hardening grant program. So their involvement's vital. Um, and uh, uh, if Shashi wants to add to this, please do. Um, but I felt that our League of California Cities presentation went very well. Um, I like to judge um, the interest based on the questions. And we had a long line of people standing behind the microphone and Sashi did a great job of collecting all of the questions. I think we had 12 or 13 questioners. Nice. So um, given that level of interest, I think it was very well received. Um, unfortunately, they didn't record it. So we won't be able to share that with you all. Um, it, however, it didn't record um, the breakouts. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, did you want to add anything else? On yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in and say, um, uh, you know, uh, Mark did a really terrific job of, of kind of getting us all organized. We were extremely well prepared. We had a very nice um, presentation laid out and we kind of, you know, uh, figured out how we were going to how we were going to run things. Um, and uh, it was a lot of information, but people were really hungry to hear it. There are so many other counties that are looking at doing a similar type of organization. As many of you know, um, I had people come up to me all throughout the rest of the conference and talk about uh, how great the presentation was and how much more they wanted to learn about what we were doing. Um, and uh, we were we were pretty practical about it too, um, and including uh, also in the, in the Western Cities article that we published beforehand that, um, you, there's a lot of groundwork that you need to lay before you can stand up an organization like this. And we were uh, fortunate that Marin already had a lot of collaboration and a lot of, um, and the support of all the electeds. So it was relatively easy for us to move forward on that. And even then, then it was, you know, there were lots of little details that had to be worked out um, that uh, the panelists talked about. Um, but uh, that, we, we, we had a great base to work from because we already had that. And most of these counties that are interested in doing this do not have that. So they're gonna to have to spend quite a bit of time getting that governance piece kind of together and getting those organizations and all of those players to want to point in the same direction and, and work together. Everybody is agreed that the, the goal is, is noble, but not everybody is agreed with the method of cooperation and how they're going to work together. And that's going to be a little bit different flavor in every county. But um, I'll, I'll echo what, what Mark said that the, um, uh, the there were there were good questions, um, that, you know, very specific, you know, specific kinds of questions. There were clearly people who were interested and knowledgeable who were there. I think we had about 60 people was kind of my final count there at our breakout session. This was when, when there were a bunch of concurrent breakout sessions. Um, and uh, so I think it was was definitely a success, and we can definitely use that material going forward as well. Thanks, Sashi. And then um, I also had the opportunity um, through the working group with the Association of Area Governments that I'm in to um, give a, uh, a forum on housing and wildfire, and um, that was last week, and that went very well. It was another panel discussion with four panelists. I was the last, and the first three panelists were amazing. Um, and I was struck by the, 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 the quality of the content. And so I'll share the link. That presentation was recorded. So I'll share the link with the board and we'll also be sure to post that link onto our Facebook so that everyone else can be able to see um, that presentation. 
And um, additionally, ABAG is very interested in MWPA model and very interested in supporting other Bay Area governments to follow our model. And um, they would like to use a lot of our material as a toolkit for other uh, counties to follow. And I'll keep you posted on that. Um, Bruce's Marin Voice, supported by Julie, um, well received from everybody I've talked to. Um, and um, I think it just speaks to so accurately to the, the conditions of our fuels out there right now. Um, I'm also excited about an upcoming um, prescribed fire panel that we will be conducting in partnership with ESP. ESP will, hope, will be hosting the panel, but we are coordinating with them. And I'm excited about the panelists that we have lined up. We have um, subject matter experts from in Marin, from outside of Marin. We have academics, we have um, uh, tr tribal representation on the panel. And I think it's just gonna be a robust conversation. Um, for your calendars, November 16th, uh, two o'clock to four o'clock. Um, and that is one of, our, one of our fellows, Maria, is working on coordinating that with um, ESP. And then we're also uh, working closely with um, Fire Safe Marin. And then when we bring on board our uh, UC Cooperative Marin Master Gardener position in Fire Smart Landscaping, it'll be, those will be the three entities, the MWPA led by Josh as part of his fellowship, Fire Safe Marin, and then the UCCE Marin Master Gardener position. We'll, we'll be coordinating and make sure that we have a consistent Fire Smart Landscaping message and excellent materials to provide for our public to follow. Um, zone Haven, um, we did our media campaign for the Know Your Zone, and one of the um, um, goals that we had with the rollout wasn't just to get people to know their zones, but we also wanted to see an increase in enrollments for Alert Marin. So um, I asked um, the EOC for information on that, and um, please let me know if you've got the, are, are you seeing my presentation mode or are you seeing the right mode? Yes. We're good. Okay. So this is really just a quick couple of slides. You can see the span um, where we average 140 registrations for four days, whereas normally our average is 31. So almost a five time increase for enrollments. Um, not quite the increase that we saw during the last and fire. Fortunately, people use the last and fire as an opportunity to enroll in Alert Marin. Um, so we're still, um, you know, we have different events that cause the, the spikes. This is the last in fire and this is the Zone Haven uh, campaign. So we're getting that message out there and we're getting more and more people enrolled in Zone or in Alert Marin. So that's that's really the, the campaign was driven. Number one, enroll in Alert Marin. Number two, learn your zone. And the third message that we wanted to convey to the public is we do have a plan. So um, that's been a big concern amongst the public that we didn't have a plan. Um, Wildfire Watch was uh, pretty successful uh, and, and also um, getting a lot of positive feedback and we are, um, Fire Safe Marin is in the process of wrapping up this month's uh, Wildfire Watch and it will be probably a half an hour. I think the hour might've been a little bit long for some people to digest. So um, we're gonna bring that down to about an hour. And I was just gonna wrap up that uh, our supervisor, Katie Rice, um, received award from California Fire Safe Council um, for elected officials in her role in helping to develop the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority. And obviously when she spoke, she, she um, deferred um, to all the people that were involved in creating the NWPA rather than, than focusing on her efforts. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Mark. Board, board members, any questions? Julie. Just a quick question, Mark. What's the percentage of the um, county residents who have enrolled in Alert Marin? <laughs> That's been a, a, a difficult number for um, the OES to come up with. And I've heard ranges of 60 to 80%. And they can tell us how many numbers they have in the system, but how many households are in the system is a, is a tougher number to define. And so that's why we have that range of 60 to 80%. I can say our biggest jump was due to getting um, data from our public utilities. They, they finally found a way that it was legal to get the, um, the data dumped from pg and &E and our other utility providers because they have a tremendous phone database. And so when we entered 
um, that data into our system, we felt like we had a 20 to 30 percent increase in, in, in households. Can we break down that information on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis? Hey, Julie, I have been asking for that for several years, um, and apparently there's a privacy consideration, um, and then there's also a logistical problem, but I think that we should all continue to ask for that and see if we can get further. Yeah, I'd love to be able to tell my residents that they're below average, not only in this, but, you know. <laughs> In other words, step up your game is what you're trying to say. Great. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Uh, directors, questions? Uh, Mark, I have a question. It's a little technical, uh, but it's good that Jason's on. You, you mentioned the, 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 the condition, the fire report, and where we are currently sitting in a bit of a lull, but expecting that we might get some northeastern winds. Um, I, I, I just made this question for further uh, discussion when we talked about the evacuation analysis, but um, to what extent can we specify the parameters in which we model fire behavior when we do our analysis of things like evacuation planning, the evacuation route clearance? Um, do, do we have the ability to specify uh, that kind of an analysis as opposed to just kind of an average fire event uh, so that we can plan accordingly? We do. However, that's been the million dollar question amongst the fire behavior analysts is, okay. is the models that have been so true for decades are proving not to be um, functioning in our, our out, today's fire out, environment. They're out of date. And, and they, they are working hard to get up to date. Um, and the other difficulty is there is no fire model for structures. And we know that structures are a significant contributor to wildfire spread. And so um, those are two fronts that the, the, the scientists have been working on is, is capturing an, a, an accurate model for today's wildfire fuel environment and also capturing how this, the model home spread of oh. structure loss. Well, so you know, we're accounting that you and Ann are going to, and Jason, of course, and Bill Tyler's of the world, are going to keep their eye on those things and keep us as current as possible, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, thank And I just want to make a statement. I want to thank Julie McMillan uh, for, for her exceedingly, you know, well-crafted piece. You know, Julie, uh, it was Mark Brown and, and uh, other folks, Jason contributed, Bill Tyler contributed. Um, I mean, my name was on, but Julie, I want to personally thank you for, and uh, on behalf of the board for all your hard work and putting that in front of the public and making the contact with the IJ and, and, and getting, that, uh, getting, getting that taken care of. So I really, I just want to thank you and recognize that Julie is a great ghost writer. <laughs> well, I enjoy writing. Um, and so I had excellent material, Bruce, that you had already shared with the board. So it was easy to do. Um, I'm sorry that IJ took quite a few liberties with their editing including deleting a brilliant quote from Mark Brown about the glass fire and how defensible space really helps certain homes in that area. Yeah. Um, and also kind of leaving the implication that the MWPA is working throughout the county when I was very careful to say it was most areas of the county. So um, kind of giving Tiburon and Belvedere a free ride, um, Im the implication was. Um, but overall, I think, um, you know, the article came out really well. Thanks to, to you, Bruce, and your great material. Okay, well, thank you. It's coming from my heart. Okay. Um, let's see, any other, uh, any questions? I, let's let's take, go to public comment, please. Allison, public. Nothing for any raise hands from our audience members. And there is no public comment. Okay, back to the uh, committee for any discussion. There's no motions required. Okay, thanks, Mark and Anne, both wonderful work moving forward. Item number six, the consent calendar. Uh, so the opportunity for the public comment on the consent calendar items will occur prior to the committee's discussion of the calendar. Committee may approve the entire consent calendar with one action as an alternative items on the calendar may be removed by any committee or staff member for separate discussion and a vote. Um, so I will first take public comment on the consent calendar. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. 
And there is no public comment. Okay, and we, uh, committee members wish to pull an item for, uh, this, uh, from the consent calendar for discussion. And I'm seeing no. Uh, I'll move to approve the consent calendar. Thank you, Julie. Motion. Second, Rodoni. Second, Dennis, thank you. Uh, Nevada, roll call, please. Nevada Fire District. Aye. County of Marin. Aye. City of Mill Valley. Aye. Town of Ross. Aye. City of San Rafael. Aye. And the motion passes. Wonderful, thanks. Thanks everybody. Uh, let's move on to the item seven, uh, board of directors meeting agenda. Mark, please. Absolutely. Um, as you guys all are aware, uh, Catherine Hilliard had a, a great suggestion during our last board meeting and that we um, was suggested we pass to the executive committee and that's to consider a different order for our um, agenda for the board of directors meetings. And that is to move um, action items earlier into the agenda in case one of our board members is not available to stay. Um, in the staff report, I gave two suggestions where we can move it. One of them is before staff reports and the other is after staff reports. Uh, the advantage to before staff reports, that's it's almost the earliest in the agenda that we can put that item. The disadvantage is some of the staff reports may have pertinent information that could inform the board's decision during an action item. So um, my recommendation is, is after staff reports. And then the disadvantage of putting it before committee reports is that some of the committee reports are done by, will be done by visitors. However, if we have a visitor that we want to give the courtesy, then we can make a special agenda item for the report to be early in the agenda so they can get in and get out and not have to wade through the, the business of the MWPA in order to report. So I just would ask for that flexibility for in that item. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, are we ready for questions then? Yep. yep. Okay. I, I, Directors, any questions about this item from Sashi, please. Yeah, I, I appreciate what Catherine was trying to get out there that, um, you know, when the meetings get a little bit longer, um, if people have other things to do, they might miss something really important. Um, but maybe another way to address that could be to figure out how to how to tighten things up a little bit or, or um, you know, fi figure out some way to have there be um, you know, have, have the meetings be a little shorter. Um, Mark, do you have any thoughts on what we could do? Um, you know, in the past we've had things like, well, you know, there's a written report that you can read in the packet and we don't have to have someone repeat it. Or I, you know, I don't, I don't wanna cut off any opportunities for people to um, have discussion or for the public to ask questions, but are, do you see any way to tighten up the time of the meeting versus the, change the order? Well, I mean, our last agenda, or um, really the, the conversation there and the consent item um, added 45 minutes to the agenda. So that that is not something that we're necessarily gonna expect every meeting. And then I personally have been trying to strike the right balance of, of not repeating our staff reports, but also giving the amount of content to, um, for the board members during the meeting and for the public. So um, yeah, for sure, we could definitely start refining aspects of it, but there's always gonna be a wild card that we may not expect from um, public comment or such. Thanks, Ashi. Uh, Julie. Well, I like the, um, the action item coming after the staff report. I think that makes sense. And I actually think our meetings have been going more quickly because we're past the startup phase. And I, I anticipate that our meetings will become more and more um, efficient and quicker as the bigger hurdles get behind us. Thanks, thank you, Julie. Um, other, other comments? Hi. Yeah, Rachel. No, I also agree. I mean, I think the, the information we get um, in advance of the action items is really important. And I'm afraid if we move the action item, it's just gonna be, um, we're gonna be end up pulling those items and having to really. Okay, Julie, you're muted. Today is the day for uh... a <laughs> frozen. Really have detailed conversations. In 
Rachel, I don't know if you can hear, but uh, you're, you're freezing up. Uh, if possible, if you could just uh, turn off your video, perhaps your audio would go through, but it looks like you're having bandwidth problems. Can you hear me? No, Rachel, we can't. Um, yeah, we, we, we cannot hear your comments. You're, you're frozen. Really frozen. Okay. Sorry. Nope. No. Um, Mark, do we have chat block? Do we have chat? Do we have capability for chat? No, but I can text her. Okay, once you text her, and I'm, and I'm trying to I'm trying to stop her video from my end, so um, so perhaps that'll help with her bandwidth. Okay, um, well let, let's let's move on. Um, uh, hi, Dennis. Yes, please. Hi, thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I'm supportive of uh, moving the action items up a couple places and putting them after staff report. I just think it would give a little flexibility to people that might have other meetings to attend or other duties to do. Um, because we want to make sure we keep a quorum too. So that's, you know, want to make sure it's early enough for the meeting to do that. As far as shortening, shortening the meeting, one thing that, for example, Tam does is the executive director does her report written and sends it out. A couple, it's not with the original agenda, but it comes a couple of days before the um, meeting. And that's a, available to the public too, that, uh, and that would just shorten up the time that Mark has. Unfortunately, Mark, we love your, your report and your enthusiasm, but that would be one way we could shorten his report. And then his executive director's report would only be for items that just popped up or some short short information that he wanted to share with the uh, with the board. So it is is a suggest it not not a firm suggestion, but it is some way that you could save some time if that report was written and given out to the board. Actually, I kind of like it because I refer back to it sometime, having a written report where I wouldn't go back and view the video to get that information. The report is nice to have sometimes. So okay. anyway. Yeah, and I I have bullet points I already put together, so it would be easy for me to just to wrap that into a staff report. Thanks, Dennis, for your suggestions. And I, I'll just say that uh, I, too, am supportive of moving it up. Um, uh, it, you know, Dennis raised this last month, and it makes sense that, indeed, we do have folks who have hard cutoffs and we, we do want them present. So um, I'm, I'm all for it. I like your idea, Dennis, of the written reports also. We'll have it and we can all, that doesn't preclude us then asking questions on the written, uh, the written statements. Um, so that, I just want to weigh in myself. Um, let's see. Bruce, I, I, oh, uh, I, I didn't weigh in on the, on the actual item. I just asked the question, um, but I, I'm kind of with Julie and Rachel that I think it should be um, after the, Rest of the material so that it can inform the discussion. Yeah, that that would put it way up in the agenda. Is my understanding? Is that right? Yeah, uh, Julie, please. Well, I was just going to say maybe there's a compromise between uh, eliminating Mark's oral remarks and having it written um, because I think it's really important to give Mark some airtime in these meetings. Um, with the public and with all the various committees and with us. So maybe, Mark, you can just do a quick PowerPoint with bullet points, um, something just to, I mean, I take copious notes of everything you say. Um, so I agree with what Dennis is saying. It'd be great to have something to refer to after the fact. Um, but I think we need to have your, your presence um, and your perspective at the beginning of each meeting. And that, that can't happen, I think, just exclusively by a written material. Great. Thank you, Julie. Great call. And, and maybe we, well, we're getting into a little bit of deliberation, Bruce, like we do often. So maybe we right. should go to public yeah, comment yeah, and go to deliberation. I know that Megan was just about to unmute, so. <laughs> you can see my hand. Did you read her mind? OK, well, um, let's, why don't we move to public comment on this item? and then we can come back to the board. Allison, please. Our first comment will come from Stephen Keese. Welcome, hey. Stephen. Hi, folks. Um, one comment is uh, you guys are an amazing group of people. And, and uh, I think Marin County has all sorts of reasons to be proud of what you're accomplishing. But one other thing I want to mention on this specific thing is that the Fire Safe Marin Board um, 
runs, uh, feels like it's moving a little bit faster because they don't do the roll call voting. They basically sort of, uh, it would be Bruce looking at everybody, say, anybody object to this? Uh -huh. And seeing no objections uh, is passed. It doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't save a lot, but it sure feels like it's moving along. So I recommend it, that be considered again. Thank you, Stephen. Duly noted. Um, I believe that we have uh, presented that question to our legal counsel over a year ago. Uh, I, I know we shouldn't be responding, but uh, that it's already been presented to us. Megan, do you want to respond to that? Um, sure. We have um, a requirement, just a Brown Act requirement that for um, actions that are taken that we have a recorded vote of who voted in favor and who voted against. And so in the Zoom setting, this is really the way we have to go about that. Um, but I appreciate that it can take a little extra time. We've tried to cut down on the number of things that are requiring roll call vote, um, which is just um, formal motions and have tried to work on consensus where possible, which takes that requirement away. But, but there definitely are areas that for resolutions and that type of thing specifically that need to have that recorded vote. Thank, thank you, Megan. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, other public comments at this time? I'm looking, I'm looking for any additional raised hands. And there's no further public comment. Um, Mark, if I may, and board, you know, we've had these discussions about how we can streamline the meeting. And, and I, uh, Mark, I know we're talking about doing a code of conduct uh, you know, for, for, for the board. Um, and just I, I, very early on uh, last year, um, we, we discussed actually writing out some specific uh, recommendations to, to assure efficiency, like not, not you know, be com come prepared, you know, read the board packet, um, you know, don't ask, if, if you haven't read the board packet, don't ask questions about the packet. <laughs> uh, but, and then there's other things about, you know, uh, board members, uh, the, a person will come up and say something and, and we'll, we'll agree. And then two or three board members just come in and say, I think that's a wonderful idea. I think that's a wonderful idea, it's, which isn't necessarily adding anything. Anyway, perhaps we could think about um, looking for, for some guidance regarding um, small, small items that could make us more efficient and put it in print and, and discuss it at some point in time. Well, and Bruce, if I may, that ties into our governance ad hoc subcommittee agenda okay. item for today. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, so are we clear, ready to move ahead? It, it seems like we have a consensus to, to move it up and try to be as efficient as possible. Um, Mark written report, um, Mark still speak, highlights and be present to answer questions. And we'll do, it sounds like you've got something to report to us in regards to uh, streamlining things. And then the consensus I'm hearing is, um, after staff reports before committee reports. Yes, is that, uh, yes, okay. I hit shaking. Okay. okay. Um, let's move on to the virtual meeting under Assembly Bill 361. Uh, Megan, please. Thank you, Bruce. Um, you may be aware that a uh, recent legislation is sort of taking the place of executive orders that have been um, in place for the last year and a half. Um, or almost two years that are for um, holding virtual meetings and sort of waiving many of the onerous requirements of the Brown Act um, related to teleconferencing. So the recent bill that was passed in mid September is um, AB 361 and it allows for continued virtual meetings and teleconferencing um, under certain circumstances, one being where there's a state of emergency and there are social distancing um, recommendations still in place. And here in Marin, we do have that currently. So that's how we're holding this meeting today. Um, the the executive committee will be asked um, if you opt to continue with um, with virtual meetings. Every 30 days, we'll have a uh, resolution on the consent agenda that will have you reconsider whether those social distancing requirements or, or um, recommendations are still in effect. So you'll see um, that coming forward on November 4th, assuming that you um, are comfortable in the virtual um, setting still. And then we also, um, are seeking some guidance today. Staff took the liberty to hold this meeting virtually based on that recommendation um, from the county 
but we um, you do have the option of trying to find another way to do a social distancing in-person meeting if you so choose. Um, so we'd like to get your input on that if, if you'd prefer virtual or um, to seek in-person as the executive committee specifically. And then also the way that the um, legislation is written, it applies to all legislative bodies of the, um, of the MWPA. So um, the board, uh, and then all of the standing committees would be fall under that definition. And so um, many areas, I mean, many um, jurisdictions, including the county, have decided to let the Board of Supervisors make the decision for all of the standing committees under their jurisdiction to um, continue with virtual meetings rather than have each one independently make that decision. Um, and so that would be something we'd also like the executive committee's input on is if you think the board should um, make such a recommendation or make such a decision for all of the standing committees or whether those committees should make those decisions independently. So um, those are the two real um, questions before you or whether you want to continue as a committee virtually and if you think um, going forward that the board would make that decision for all committees. And if, if I may add a little bit just in it because it may help inform your guys's discussion and questions is for our smaller committees, the exec committee, finance committee, and citizens oversight committee, we have space at the Southern Marin Fire Department headquarters for that size of a committee um, and public space. If it's for our larger committees to full board, ops, and advisory technical, then we are targeting the Marin Clean Energy site um, for um, meetings. And my biggest concern with that is um, we're bringing 17 member agencies together in one room. Um, and so it, it provides a lot of um, crossbreeding for a lack of a better word. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay, questions. Uh, Sashi, please. And Dennis. Uh, yeah, uh, Mark, we, for LAFCO, we also looked at, um, you know, we previously had meetings in the marine clean energy space, but there's not, even if you can get all the board members in there, you can't get much public in there. So I'm wondering if there are alternate spaces. Um, you know, maybe Dennis can come in on the the um, board of soups chamber because there are very few spaces that are big enough to accommodate a very large board and the public with distancing. So I'm wondering if you've looked at other options there um, before we discuss what we're going to do with this group. I have considered a few different options. I was, um, you know, obviously familiar with the, the board of supervisors, and I think if we went into the planning and the supervisor chambers, it could, would be a tight fit for 17 members at at, um, at the dais. But I, it's it's doable. Um, and then I thought about some other um, auditorium type arrangements, but um, the advantage to MCE and the board of supervisors is the the AV to be able to record and and broadcast is already there. What about Central Marin Police? Is that not quite big enough? I don't think it's big enough. I can take a look though, but from my recollection, I don't think it's big enough. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank, thanks, Sashi. Other board members? Mark, uh, Dennis, excuse me. Yeah, I was gonna actually ask Mark that question. I'm not sure MCE is very accommodating when it comes to the public. And I think we're going under the assumption that public health uh, it will continue to want only 50% capacity. And so the Board of Supervisor Chamber limited to about 100 total. We are going hybrid probably November 2nd is our go live point, but it will be hybrid where people will have the option of doing Zoom or phone call-ins. And we are limiting the capacity to 100. And we are continuing to pass this legislative uh, law that's uh, allowed us to do uh, um, Zoom meetings, because we do think there'll be meetings in the future, like the Truth Act forum, that we will just go all Zoom because we're intense, anticipating a larger crowd than the uh, room poll. So that's the nice part about following the legislative act is that you can keep that flexibility in, in your schedule. If you have a meeting that you anticipate the room won't hold the number coming, you could go all Zoom at that point or whatever. I I would, I really like committee meetings by Zoom. I'm, I'm I'm a kind of a big fan of Zoom just because it's much easier in my life not traveling great distances to get the meetings. Yes. Um, so I'm kind of a big fan of our committee meetings on Zoom because of that reason. And also I think that the upside is we waste a lot of, we develop a lot of greenhouse gases traveling around the county when maybe yeah. it's not maybe it's not needed anymore. 
So I think we should consider that. I do think the board meetings in person would be an advantage though, just to, to get to know each other better. And I think uh, we can probably accommodate it at the Board of Supervisors. I don't think Thursdays are very busy there, but I might be mistaken. We should check with Diane, the Patterson, uh, Mark, but we do have hybrid capa uh, capabilities there through our provider NTT. So if we wanted to do a hybrid meeting, we could actually do it in the board chambers. Thank Thanks. you for very, very thorough uh, input and comments. Rachel, please. No, I agree. Um, I think it's important that we stay with Zoom for at least for a while because we're just not able to accommodate. It. And if we were concerned at the last item of people's time being short, it will be shorter if we're meeting in person, if they are not able to, if a item goes over time. Um, and I'm afraid people will end up having to leave but I like Dennis's point about, you know, all of us driving to, to a location right now, it does not seem to fit with where, where we're going. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Sashi, again, please. Yeah, um, I wanted to just add that our for Mill Valley, the last in-person meeting that we had, we um, anticipated a lot of public comment. And so we set up um, an alternate location just in front of City Hall, we set up 50 chairs, we set up, um, you know, the video so that they could watch the meeting. And then we allowed time um, for each item to check with the people outside. And then we had a process kind of already figured out for how we were going to swap people in and out in groups of 10. So if we're going to do something like that, um, you know, planning for that in advance, I think, you know, something that staff should um, think about and maybe talk to some of the city clerks about what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Sashi. Any other? Uh, Julie, please. Yeah, um, I I would love to see all of you in person. Uh, I would love to meet some of you for the first time in person. Um, but I think, um, you know, the, the logistics are still too complicated and the health risks, I think, are still too um, big. And I don't think we want to be blazing the trail to have in-person meetings at this time. I think it's a good uh, it's great to reevaluate on the consent every month. And if things change dramatically, and if we get a green light from the um, health department, then um, I think we would all feel better about going to an in-person board meeting forum. Thank you, Julie. I think that's a good, good summary. Uh, I am fully comfortable with Zoom. Uh, I think that I, I know you all. Uh, I feel like a little bit better than virtually. And um, I think that, that, that there's just really no down to what we currently have. We can communicate, uh, we can interact with the public, uh, we can see each other you know, up front and close, which we may not be able to do in a meeting. So I, and given the monthly check-in, as, as Julie just said, I'm, I'm comfortable with staying virtual and evaluating it monthly. And then I will continue knowing at some point we are gonna be going in person. Um, at least for the board meetings, I'll continue to look at options and I'll, I'll connect with Diane Dennis on the, the water soups and maybe take some measurements of the dais to see how easily we can fit 17 people in there and check the schedule. Thanks, Mark. Um, should we go to public comment? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, back to us again for any further discussion. I, I think we have a consensus. Uh, Mark, you'll you'll continue to do your research, and we'll revisit this monthly um, and just watch watch how things develop. So thank thanks, really great great discussion. Thanks everybody. And, and Rachel does have her hand up. Oh, I just Rachel, have, I'm yeah, sorry. sorry. No, no, no. And, and a little bit off of this, but in terms of public comment, if we're staying on Zoom, I know some jurisdictions are considering bringing public comment and allowing the video. Um, so people can have the video, you know, just to make a little bit more connection with people um, during public comment to bring them into the room and then bring them out. So I don't know if that's something we'd want to consider, but um, it might be helpful. I think the Dennis, I think you guys do that. Um, and so I, I think the community has asked more for that and it might be something we'd like to consider. So do I understand Rachel, you're su uh, suggesting actual when the, when the, when the public comments that we can actually see them is that they're brought but, into the panelist zoom room yes and then okay. brought back out so um it's a face to a name and again more connection 
that we, if we're going to continue with the Zoom. Good, That's a wonderful suggestion. I'm, I'm seeing head shake. And yes, and, and it, it's a pretty, pretty easy uh, setting to change for us in Zoom to allow the video. Okay. Yeah, we just want to make sure that staff staff is comfortable with all those logistical changes. We just have to make sure that that's all set up. That's pretty easy. Okay, great. Uh, I think I think we're we're all in agreement here, moving forward. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for that last comment. Um, so let's move on to item number eight. Uh, Mark, the governance ad hoc subcommittee. Uh, you're on. All right, I'm following up on a suggestion that we've talked about a couple of times that came from uh, Rachel, and that is to set up a governance ad hoc subcommittee. And um, the president of the board, Bruce, was um, directed to create an ad hoc subcommittee. And when, when Bruce and I talked about the board members that we have and who's the right audience or who's the right uh, participation for that committee, it was it turned out to be the executive committee. And... Um, and um, that means anytime that the five of you get together it would be a public meeting. However, we think that this topic dis um, discussion can easily be handled and um, efficiently and also very transparently be handled um, during the executive committee meetings. And my suggestion is that um, staff does research into different uh, JPAs and government entities similar to ours, provide um, recommendations to you all of and options of the succession planning of to uh, vice president, president, if vice, a single vice president is efficient or do we need to have a second vice president? And um, to Bruce's point earlier, a, a code of conduct uh, for the board members for during meetings and interacting with, with staff consultants and so on. So um, I, we, uh, staff has already taken the liberty to do some of that legwork already. And then I would ask each of you, if you have any suggestions, then please forward them my way. And then we, we, we will include that into the staff report for next executive committee meeting. And then we will have an action item that would be the governance portion of that effort. Thanks, Mark. Very, very uh, clear, thorough report. Thanks very much. Uh, let's go to the board for any questions, please. Sashi. Sorry, I'm confused. So are you saying that we're, gonna, we're not going to have the ad hoc committee, but you're just going to do a staff report and we're going to look at it at the executive committee? Is that what? what? Yeah, okay. and you'll, you'll, you'll put on a, a governance hat. Oh, okay. Okay. It'll be basically, okay. it is Thank still you. the governance Thanks for clarifying that. subcommittee, but as the executive committee. Okay. Okay, thanks for the question, Sashi. Other board members, any questions? No, I, I saw a lot of heads nodding. So, and again, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> We're on a roll. Um, let's go to the public, please. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, great. Back to the uh, committee for any further discussion. I think the item's fairly clear. Mark, excellent report. Uh, and all, we'll all do all our, our homework. Uh, anything we want to present to Mark, please. And um, Rachel, you had some good suggestions originally. Let's just put our thoughts uh, in writing to Mark and uh, we can move this along pretty quickly. And about two weeks before our next executive committee, I'll send a reminder to the committee um, to, to forward comments to me. Great. Okay, uh, well, uh, something I'm excited about, item B, the Fire Foundry up, update. Mark and Jason um, and, and all, uh, we're looking forward to hearing all about this. So Mark, you're on. That's all, Jason. All righty, thank you. And uh, I'll have, uh, there comes uh, Dr. Damone. So uh, first, exciting to be in front of you today. This has been a, a project in the works, working behind uh, the scenes, as all of you are, are doing amazing work um, in, in front of the public continually with, with the MWPA. Uh, it's also fun to be back in front of all of you guys. Um, it's been a, a nice little break, but uh, glad to be back. Uh, just by, by way of starting introduction, um, kind of the concept behind this here is we have more work than we have capacity to do the work right now. Uh, I don't think that comes as a surprise to anybody. Um, you know, at your board's direction, uh, we have pursued aggressively grant funding from CAL FIRE on top of the MWPA funding, um, but the work is substantial, 
and we are taxing our local contractors, which is great, um, but we also need to add capacity to the system. So this is really a, a piece of that. And uh, I will share my screen if that works with you. So we have a little, oh, Mark, I just need you to allow me to share um, a little quick presentation to give you some background. Um, and I will work through sharing here. All righty, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So the Fire Foundry and a little history behind the name. One, we felt it was critically important to be inclusive, uh, that, that this really is a multi-agency, multidisciplinary uh, program and attaching one uh, logo of any one single agency, uh, I think would do it injustice. So a little bit about the Fire Foundry, the word fire, obviously an important word, um, but fire innovation, recruitment and education um, is, is what's behind it. And then Foundry really came out of uh, some of the catalysts of UC Berkeley, which uh, I believe actually has a foundry where they, you know, uh, take molten metals and, and turn them into something. And similar to what we're trying to do with our program is, you know, mold individuals, uh, giving them the, the skills they need to be successful while they earn this opportunity to work in fire emergency services. So that's a little history on the name. Um, one, it doesn't brand a single individual agency in this county because we're all in this together. Uh, two, it really is molding individuals, giving them the, the tools they need to be successful as they move through um, and, and are successful in a sustainable wage career uh, in, in emergency services. I guess, okay, the, uh, the development team. Uh, so by way of introduction, Josh Damon, uh, Dr. Josh Damon uh, from Stanford is on with me uh, to co-present here today. Uh, but this core team um, was, you know, myself representing the fire agencies uh, in Marin and in kind of the fire service background, uh, along with a host of other individuals, Mark and, and uh, uh, Bill from MWPA and, and others from local fire agencies. Sophia Martinez is an equity analyst out of the county's uh, Office of Equity. Uh, Angel Miner is the CEO of Conservation Corps North Bay. Uh, Dr. Thomas Oswell is an environmental scientist at, at Cal Berkeley. And uh, uh, also from Cal, a researcher, uh, Suk Singh, who um, is, uh, you know, both of them have contributed a great deal. And then of course, Josh, a social scientist with a strong and long history and background um, in equity and uh, inclusion. So Josh, I, I don't want you to do or do you a disservice, Dr. Damon, by introducing you. So I'll, I'll let you pop up and just introduce yourself since you're the other team member with me today. Uh, sure, I can do that. You, that. That was a great introduction. I don't think I need to add too much. Um, just a social science research scholar at Stanford. Um, I've, like he said, done a lot of work in the past around um, uh, kind of equity-based development of programs and um, participatory kind of community work, research, and program design. So, and uh, a little background on how we got tied in with uh, Berkeley and Stanford. We were looking for a grad student to help put the program together for us, somebody that we could hire to kind of champion the program. It became apparent very early, both from the PhD uh, researchers, uh, professors at Stanford and Berkeley, that this was complicated and for a younger grad student um, or a less experienced grad student to walk into understanding you know, 17 agencies, um, multiple nonprofits, a philanthropic arm to fill some of the voids uh, was a complicated issue. And uh, credit to the three individuals, they stood up and said, we'll take this project on um, and bring in grad students to help as needed, but uh, they've been instrumental in the, in the development. So a little bit about the vision, uh, what we're trying to do is really develop a wildfire prevention workforce program that pipelines disadvantaged uh, you know, uh, communities, individuals uh, within Marin, um, pointing them in the direction of a sustainable wage career and breaking systemic cycles of poverty. Uh, we have a great opportunity here with all of the work that we're doing around wildfire prevention um, on the same token to do it with the lens of equity. And that's really what this is about. So what's our problem? Well, I think we're all 
intimately aware of our problem in, in California. You know, 4 million acres last year burned, countless homes destroyed, uh, you know, fire uh, the size of Connecticut um, has, has been a problem in, in the greater state of, of California. And I think that, uh, you know, talking to my peers, Cal Fire across, everybody realized realizes, you know, Marin is very vulnerable. Um, and and to, to our voters' credit, uh, to your leadership, um, we've developed a, a pretty unique program. As you mentioned with the uh, League of Cities presentation, there is a ton of interest, um, and it even includes national interest, on what we've done here in Marin County. And I think this is just another opportunity for us to show a great deal of leadership and how we do it with an equity lens. Um, so we're, we're really working to solve a couple of problems here. One of them is, is the fire problem, but the other is pathways to a sustainable way of career path for those that may not have considered that in the past. Um, so what are we trying to do? We're, we're trying to break that cycle of poverty. Um, the fire founder creates access to high paying uh, careers and jobs, specifically targeting disadvantaged communities. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we have massive amounts of work to do in reducing hazardous vegetation and bolstering our prevention efforts uh, and things like home hardening, defensible space um, that some of our community members don't have access to. Uh, and, and in the larger piece is that vegetation management work. Uh, doing that and providing a pathway to a sustainable wage career. And then, you know, a targeted recruitment strategy uh, with, with our community partners. And we'll talk a little bit about our community partners uh, in this next phase. So early on, um, we, we really tried not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we know that there's a lot of great work being done out there. Um, and, and the Conservation Core North Bay is, is a leader in this arena. They're a trusted community partner. Uh, they, they already have crews out doing work. Um, that was a natural nexus uh, to the program and, and not reinventing the wheel and doing something new. I think I also want to make sure I highlight that having them as a partner has allowed us to stay competitive um, and our rates are what we're seeing uh, in a competitively bid process from private contractors. So we won't be overpaying for these services. Um, and really when we, we looked at developing this program, we wanted something that could be uh, uh, recreated, um, duplicated across the state, uh, and, and also be able to grow organically here uh, in Marin County. Um, and, and again, stay competitive um, with, with rates the, of private industry. So I'm going to turn it over to Josh, who's going to talk a little bit about how we plan to do this uh, and, and our approach. Thanks, Chief Weber. So um, I mean, as we're specifically trying to build a sustainable wage career pathway for people that haven't had access to a sustainable wage career pathway, particularly young adults, um, 18 to 24 or so, um, we realize that there's a lot of other barriers um, to doing that. So part of this process has been building out the community partnerships and the county partnerships necessary to ensure that we provide the wide range of possible services that people are going to need to help overcome those barriers, financial and otherwise. Um, Big one, of course, clearly possible housing uh, and food supports. That's something that we're really working on right now is to provide housing for the participants, which also work towards getting them into the, the life that is going to be following uh, at a fire station. Right? If, they get, if they follow through and do the full pathway into fire service. Um, mentorship and coaching, something that we're working a lot on. Uh, be working more with the union and other fire agencies and associations around the Bay Area and in Marin to build one-on-one -on -one mentorship with existing fire professionals um, and other fire-related career professionals with each of our participants. Behavioral health services, of course, groups um, that bring in social worker that's going to be able to help provide some case management um, and also kind of assess what other needs we might need as those come up, um, whether there be some individual or group-based um, therapeutic needs and other things like that. Um, educational tutoring uh, in partnership with College of Marin, where we're going to be leading the curriculum for the program, um, and some amazing community agencies that we're working on, working with uh, developing a plan right now to help provide that added tutoring, um, both for the curriculum that we're putting forward and then 
in the future for other categories of participants in the fire academy, EMT, things like this. Um, and of course, basic career development um, skills and life planning skills, which Conservation Corps North Bay already has internal um, to some of their work, but we're also gonna be adding curriculum at uh, College of Marin, and that will have the added benefit of, of giving them credits uh, towards either an AAAS degree or towards kind of more priority admittance in fire academies, which like to see prior credits before uh, accepting people. Um, and life skill planning um, connected to all of that. So these are the, the, the sets of services that we're um, building into the program through lots of partnerships, some within the County of Marin government itself and some external agencies and other community partners. Okay, next. And actually I left out a major component of the beginning of this when I talked about the, what we're actually proposing. So this is a, a 12 person uh, fuels crew uh, that would, would be uh, employed by Conservation Corps North Bay. There would be two supervisors on the crew. One would be a, a fire person. The other would be a CCMB uh, supervisor. And then there'd also be a coordinator behind uh, that would be regularly checking in with the, the recruits and, and making sure that if there's any services that Josh just mentioned, they're needed. So this, this 12 person crew with two supervisors, a total of 14 individuals will be in the field 200 days a year. Um, so that's four days a week. And their fifth day of the week, Josh will speak about the educational component in a moment, but they'll be working four 10 hour days in the field either doing uh, critical fuel reduction work on evacuation routes, on some of the larger uh, um, projects that, that are planned, uh, or also working on, on home hardening pieces um, where, where we're having, struggling to get contractors for that smaller work to come out uh, for, for a reasonable uh, price. So miss that as I discussed it. So that's, that's in the general concept of the proposal, and then these other services are supporting it. So I'll go to the next slide now, Josh, sorry. No problem, that, that's perfect. Um, so that Friday is gonna be the educational component that we bring into this program. The partnership right now between Berkeley, uh, myself at Stanford and College of Marin. College of Marin has been absolutely central to this. Um, we've been working with the workforce development team. Um, and uh, so that Friday we'll be offering the curriculum, the core, the core curriculum that you need to get into Fire Academy clearly is emergency medical response and emergency medical technician. So we're building that into the summer and fall. And then in the time outside of that, we're building uh, modules um, based around project-based learning for things that you've all been discussing uh, extensively already. A lot of the new emerging um, technologies and science and innovations in fire prevention, mitigation, rapid response, early detection, um, connecting the skill sets that help build those sorts of things with uh, our participants. So we're going to be giving them uh, modules in geographic information systems, computer science, um, kind of basic computer systems, landscape ecology and fire ecology, particular to Marin in Northern California, all these skill sets and certifications, which will allow them to put on their resume and, and evolving CV, what they're capable of doing in a very applied sense, um, with the idea that it'll both make them kind of extra qualified, uh, incredible firefighters uh, when they get down that path and through fire academy and start applying to jobs, but also possibly if they decide that fire, the fire route specifically, firefighter route specifically is, is not for them, other possible fire-related career options, whether that be with amazing agencies like the MWPA, uh, CAL FIRE, with other, other uh, fire-related work, parks, open space, um, and these sorts of things. So that's the idea here. And I should um, add to that, Chief, real quick, which is, so our category one kind of recruits is going to be that core team that's uh, earning uh, livable wages doing that contract work for clearance uh, for fire, um, for vegetation management and home hardening, defensible space work uh, for the county. We're also, um, the idea down the road is that they would then progress to the following stage of fire academy. And after that seasonal work uh, with Marin Fire. And then after that, you know, we'd, we'd help them move into full-time fire work, either in Marin or elsewhere um, as, it's, as it becomes available. 
until we have that full pipeline developed, we're going to be bringing in, and as we move, we're going to be bringing in um, uh, existing fire academy recruits. Um, we're going to be reaching out to existing seasonals in Marin Fire um, and other fire departments, and also some full timers that may want to follow up with their AA or AS degree, um, kind of build in some of these extra skills that we're offering those Fridays uh, in you know, science and technology, fire science and technology, um, and uh, also supporting them through other stages um, in their career development and, and um, progression. So th there's these other categories that are gonna be key to this uh, and the fire service itself will begin getting these options before our, our core recruits in that category one even progress into seasonal work. Can go on to the next unless you had something to add, Chief. No, I, I think that's it. I, I think that we all recognize that the, the California Fire Service, uh, certainly here in Marin, um, you know, is, is disproportionately uh, male and, and Caucasian. And we need to have uh, the opportunity to bring in, you know, specifically more women into the fire service, more people of color. Um, and, and this will allow us, uh, you know, targeting uh, these communities, which predominantly, um, uh, you know, share that. And these individuals may not have seen themselves uh, as having an opportunity in the fire service. And we want to make them, you know, aware that this is a career path and um, it's one that they can uh, sustain with a sustainable wage career um, moving forward. So, uh, you know, it'll be very targeted and I think it'll be an excellent opportunity. Uh, when Josh says, you know, Marin Fire, um, we're really we're talking about the Marin Fire Service. Collectively, uh, all the fire agencies are on board with this concept. We look at this as a feeder program uh, to, to all of them um, and all of them will, will enjoy the benefit of having this crew available uh, for work that they're doing in their communities. Uh, so they'll get a chance to work with different fire agencies, uh, experience, you know, uh, different things throughout the county, different types of work, whether it be roadside vegetation, whether it be uh, uh, a larger scale uh, a fuel reduction project, uh, home hardening. Uh, it's really going to give them that, that broad perspective. A little bit about next steps. Um, and since we have the Board of Supervisors president on the call today, I'll call out the leadership there and, and thank them. Because Tuesday we'll be bringing a $2.2 million contract uh, with California, or no, excuse me, Conservation Corps North Bay uh, to the board. Um, predominantly, the funding for this program will come from the work that this crew is doing. Uh, so, so that will be a pass through to CCMB um, for those services. So CCMB will be an employer of these recruits, as well as providing one supervisor uh, the fire agencies will collectively come together and provide the fire supervisor, um, which is yet to be determined uh, as to who that will be. Uh, um, the goal is to start the program January 31st would be the first day that the recruits start. Uh, the application process will open uh, shortly after uh, the Board of Supervisors meeting next week. Um, and then, of course, we're open to any questions, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we'd like to fit all of the logos of all the agencies that are participating, um, but it is gonna be quickly, uh, nearly impossible to do that. There's so many more uh, community partners that are out there, philanthropic arms that are ready to support. Uh, you know, All of the Marin Fire Agencies are represented by the Marin County Fire Chiefs logo. Um, and, and we're really looking forward to this one, to build capacity in the fields work we're doing, uh, but also to give people an opportunity that otherwise would not have seen uh, the fire service as a career path, uh, that, that ability to do that. So Josh and I are open to any questions you have. Thank, thank you both. Uh, this is just fantastic. Um, thank you, Josh and Jason. Board, uh, any, any questions? I Let's do. see, Rachel and Dennis, please. This is, it looks like a fantastic program. Um, I just wanna ask, it, you have one, it's 12 individuals. Um, so that's one cohort. When would you start the next cohort? Would so it, the goal is, it, is, is a one year in phase one, which would be have the, the, the most service intensive 
uh, program. So those wraparound services, uh, housing support, um, really getting them off of, you know, on their feet and, and a catalyst, um, an introduction to things. Uh, that first year cohort will move into year two, uh, which they'll be more self-sustaining, uh, have, have, you know, services to provide them that boost. Uh, and then our goal would be that this is about a four-year program, uh, you know, with the first year being the most intense and, and the most service heavy. And then as they move through the phases, uh, they, they really start to self-sustain um, with, with a job and whether it be with Novato Fire or Cal Fire or Marin, um, you know, an opportunity to, to shine um, and, and sort of fly the nest, if you will. Uh, but as Josh mentioned, you know, continue uh, with, with counseling services, educational support, um, everything they need for a successful track. Ultimately, our goal is to see these individuals return in, in a mentoring uh, capacity. And, and you saw the union's logo. Uh, the County Fire Union 1775 is committed uh, to supporting this initiative, as well as providing um, uh, mentorship through their members. Uh, so, so all the way around, um, you know, it's, it's really it's, it's a catalyst in year one and, and moving on from there. Great. And I'm wondering, so the cost that's being proposed, the 2.2, is that for just the initial startup in the first four years? Or is it for the first year? What was that covering? So the 2.2 million is the two-year pilot uh, to run the, the phase one program. So the 12 recruits through uh, at that level. Um, and the, the revenue generated by doing the work, again, based on a competitive bid process and what we're seeing from private contractors uh, for the fields work will cover that um, in its entirety. Nice. All right. I was wondering in terms of recruiting, um, is high school age students too early? So we have explorer programs in multiple fire agencies through the county, uh, Novato, Ross Valley, and County Fire, um, where high school students could, could enter. And um, so because of the requirements of 18 years old and a few other things, um, you know, they would probably be precluded and it's a full-time job with, with uh, uh, you know, the fifth day of the week being education that they, you know, what we'll start to do is in Marin County Office of Education as one of the partners is certainly highlight individuals that will be coming out of high school and probably excellent candidates for this program. Uh, we can point them towards one of the Explorer programs as an interim step, and they'll be a you know one step ahead. Uh, but this will be for individuals that are ready to start you know full time education and full time employment. Right. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. Uh, I have. Yeah. Can I have one more question? Yeah, go ahead, Rachel. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. This is what we've been talking about so much in terms of and when you know my role on the school board and we've been talking about how to what are these pathways that we get students into these programs. Um, how do we, is there a guaranteed position at the end of the program so that we keep them in the county? Um, Good question. Is that, so that and carrot, something, some carrot at the end? Yeah, we're confident that the program we're building is going to make them an excellent candidate. And, and certainly for that step into the seasonal firefighter job, which is, you know, you look at Marin County Fire with 80 plus percent of our full-time employees being from our seasonal program. Uh, Cal Fire uh, mimics that and, and other fire agencies. So unlike some of the programs that are apprenticeship, maybe with construction or something else where they guarantee a job at the end, uh, through the civil service hiring processes, that's not possible. Um, but what we have to do then is make sure that they are top tier candidates um, and will succeed in the process. And uh, to Josh and all those wraparound services, mentoring, coaching, developing, um, you know, everything from interviews and resumes to, uh, you know, having a resume with experience and education. Um, you know, we feel strongly that at the end of this, these candidates will, will be top notch um, and compete with, with, you know, everyone out there. But, and again, while we're partnered with CCNB, civil service hiring processes can be a challenge, um, but a necessary evil. And, uh, so there isn't a guaranteed job at the end, but, but we feel confident they'll succeed. Great, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Dennis, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, 
Jason, for the great report. It's a really exciting program. And I want to personally thank you for your leadership here and, and the partnership you put together, because um, I would be the first to say fire always walks the talk and gets things done. And you've proven that with the vaccinations and we're in, and this is another example of your great leadership. So I wanna thank you and your whole team and your partnership. I'm wondering if you've talked about targeting census tracts in Marin that we've already identified as low income and people of need and people of color as part of the program. Yeah, absolutely. And a matter of fact, I think some of the good work that ran around the vaccination um, targets, uh, we were able to use some of that data and shared it uh, with the team. Uh, the other piece is trusted community partners, Canal Alliance, uh, uh, Marin, Marin City uh, Community Development, um, uh, you know, up in Hamilton. So very targeted, specific already trusted community partners and bringing them to the table. And that's a lot of the good work that, that Josh and Sophie who's not here with us today have done um, is, is reaching out to those specifically um, and then being very purposeful uh, as we move towards the application process uh, and uh, removing barriers. Uh, I think again, to highlight one of the great partnerships here with CCMB, if somebody isn't a legal citizen um, but has, you know, the right to work papers or whatever that is exactly. Um, the, the CCMB is very familiar with that. And that's something that we couldn't necessarily do as a public agency. Um, you know, and, and so they're already a trusted partner there and, and have a lot of those connections, but, uh, to your original question, yes. Um, we're, we're using some of the same data from the vaccine piece to target, uh, you know, certain, certain, uh, demographics. Thanks, Jason. I just think the recognition that Senator McGuire was very helpful in this uh, funding for, I think, this program. So just want to mention him. Yeah, absolutely. I should certainly say that the, the, the bridge funding for this two-year pilot provided uh, at the support of the County Board of Supervisors is coming from a uh, CAL FIRE uh, allocation that was done by the legislator. Uh, specifically to bolster uh, fuels crews and fire crews in the state. And so the contract counties, which Marin is one of, was allocated uh, funds and, and we're taking a portion of those funds um, and, and supporting this program. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Jason. Other, other uh, director's questions? Julie, please. Um, yeah, Chief Weber, this is great. Um, I'm just wondering if after the pilot, then there'll be another um, group of 12 um, starting in, I guess that would be 2023 and it will just continue um, in perpetuity. Is that what you're thinking? That is absolutely our goal. So uh, this first round is really to understand and, and we know we're going to learn. There's gonna be a lot of lessons learned and we're going into it with, with that concept. Uh, uh, and then as we develop and build, you know, phase two, those individuals go into phase two, phase one, and ultimately, you know, our goal is to find dormitory style housing in the county um, that would allow for one of those major barriers uh, to be lifted. And, and so that will be part of our success. We, we are looking at our philanthropic uh, um, generous folks here in the county to help bridge that gap because we understand that'll be, you know, a one-time funding gap um, that needs to be bridged. So that'll be a major, a major component of our work in the first year is to identify that our intention right now is um, the old San Rafael station three on St. Joseph's court, which the county just recently purchased uh, to use that as an interim basis. It's, it's certainly not uh, a long-term piece, but it's a short-term uh, solution as, as we build on, on some more housing for this. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Other other directors. Uh, J Jason, I've, I've, I've a question. I, I've done this work. It's, gr it's gritty work. It's dangerous work. And um, having been with the Forest Service as a firefighter and brush crew leader, project crew leader, um, what, what I'm hearing then is this model is, is the Conservation Corps North Bay is function as a business, really, an entity that is going to be a, a, applying or, or uh, putting in proposals for contracts. There's, there'll, there'll be work advertised 
um, they, they will bid on, on, on jobs and commit to getting that work done. So um, I, I'm, I'm can ask the workman's compensation question. And uh, in the event of an injury, um, you know, it, a, a sole proprietorship, a, a business, they, they, they pay into, and you, you know well about this as, a, as, a, as our a county fire officer, but um, I, I'm assuming that, um, that, that injuries, uh, poison oak, you know, chainsaw cuts, um, back sprains, broken ankles that in, you know, fall in a tree stump, um, it, it, all, all of that is just, you'll be operating as a business, is that correct? With, with, with no, no consequence or liability for the people who uh, contract with, with, with these folks. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, this is part of the benefit of having CCNB. They, they're doing this work already. Uh, they're out doing fields work with our county parks and open space, cities okay. and towns. Um, they're very familiar with this. They are, they have their own workers compensation program. Um, and I think another benefit here and, and true to our measure C, um, campaign, we are, we are doing this in the most fiscally conservative manner we can. We're staying even as, as a public private partnership here, we are maximizing the dollars that we're using. We're staying competitive with, with private industry. And we're able to do that with this partnership, and and it's one of the uh, one of the main reasons we we tapped CCNB on the shoulder and said, "Can you work with us on this?" Um, because as as you're familiar, being a fire director, um, public agencies and and specifically public safety, the workers' compensation piece can be uh, prohibitive in some ways in in getting things done. So, uh, I think that you know again, this is another great example for bringing a private nonprofit. To the table to partnership with us and the public agencies to get this great work done um, in, in in really the same dollars you spend by hiring a private contractor. Okay, and then just one other question, and it, it is it is around then um, benefits uh, associated with this work. Um, if if you're a recruit, you come in, you're going to be there for four years. Um, I'm assuming there's an hourly wage and all these wraparound services. What about things like medical and dental, and uh, you know the really essential. Uh, to, to, to a person's well-being. Are, are, are they part of the wraparound services or is this on the periphery that they're going to have to procure on their own? So great questions. And we'll add this. This is our, our trial run here before the Board oh. of Supervisors Tuesday, um, which Angel, the CEO of CCMB, will be with us and answer specifically. But these individuals will have a living wage. Um, so it will be above, well above minimum wage. Um, and I think it's around $21 an hour, if I'm not mistaken, okay. they'll also receive full medical and dental benefits, which okay. I think, as you mentioned, is a critical component, um, for their success, because we know if they're ill or, or have, you know, uh, an oral mouth problem, it's going to preclude from work. So yes. those services will be provided, uh, at, under CCMB. And this is, is what they do with their current recruits. So it's, it's pretty cool. Fantastic, fantastic, and fantastic. <laughs> um, gosh, this is so, anyways, <laughs> other directors, please. Okay, well, well let's, uh, let's take a wonderful presentation, Josh and, and Jason. Um, public comment, please. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. Our first comment will come from Stephen Keese. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, just one word comment. Wow. Thanks, Stephen. Well, well spoken, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for any further raised hands. And there's no more public comment. Okay. Uh, back to the committee for discussion. Julie, please. Um, I would like for the entire board to um, hear at least a portion of this presentation and become familiar with this program. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I concur, Julie. Um, your, your information is just incredible here. It's just such a wonderful program. Um, and Bruce, if, if I may add, um, we did author a letter with Bruce's signature of support to send to the Board of Supervisors that was sent this morning. And um, Jason and I had talked about a, a presentation to the full board as well. We wanted to get in front of you guys today so that you weren't caught by surprise on Tuesday when this is coming to the board. And 
Um, the MWPA is mentioned as a partner, and I will be reaching out to the rest of our board members to suggest that they watch this portion of the video so they all they as um, won't be surprised if they when they see that on the agenda. Okay, Julie. Um, I think one thing that should be emphasized perhaps a little bit more is the fact that this is fiscally conservative um, and that it's kind of um, neutral in terms of the uh, implications to uh, the MWPA and any other fire department's budget because of the competitive bidding um, component. Um, and so it's really a win-win because um, it is uh, competitive and it's providing uh, such an enhanced opportunity for so many people across the county. So Jason, I really commend you. Um, I think this is brilliant. Thanks, Julie. And, and just as a, a contextual piece, uh, we just went out to bid for projects here in the Ross Valley and we're looking at about three plus thousand dollars a day for a five person crew. And so when you look at a 14 person crew and, and we're shooting for a daily rate of 6,000, um, you know, we may even be below uh, the, the daily rate of a private crew. And again, we're not trying to compete, recognizing there's more work here than we have capacity for. So we're building capacity in the system um, and, and doing it in a way. And I think, again, our partnership with CCMB, doing it in a way that, that um, benefits all, because a lot of those folks that are working, those, you know, specifically some of the contractors are not on that pathway to a sustainable wage career. Many of them fit the demographics of what we're looking looking for in our program and ultimately the fire service. So we'll, we'll highlight that. Great, great suggestion. Uh, that, that question raises for me having dealt with contracts and contracting, whether you contract by the by the day or hour or by, by the job. And I don't know what the structures are here, um, uh, what the conventions are. <coughs> Um, is, is there, a, uh, are, are we doing both or, um, and you understand the question, whether it's an absolute contract price for say, uh, you know, 23 miles of roadside clearance, uh, absolute pro contract price, or whether it's, whether it's a daily price, how, how are we bidding these things? So the agencies are using their procurement processes, local agencies that they're yeah. already in existence. So. Uh, to your point, Bruce, some of them are being bid as an entire project. So okay. you're looking at, at bidding it as a whole. Others are bidding at daily rates. Uh, we're finding with the evacuation route work um, that the daily rate uh, remains competitive and, and like for like uh, because not all roads are the same. So you may be able to travel a half a mile in one day on one road and only 200 yards on another. Right. Um, so, so, but they are, they we're using each individual agencies are using their own competitive bid processes that are approved by their councils and boards. Okay. Yeah. They have fiduciary responsibilities to, to get the best deal. So, okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Other, other, uh, any uh, discussion here? Okay. Uh, boy, this is fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, Jason. We look forward to working with you. Uh, this thank you all for your leadership. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to item C, um, uh, the Citizens Oversight Committee, Citizen Oversight Committee recruitment. Mark, please. Thank you very much. Um, so the Citizens Oversight Committee has established a three-year term, and we have nine members. In order to stagger the, the times that people are leaving the um, Citizens Oversight Committee, we had to draw lots for who was gonna have a, the first one-year term, who was gonna have the first two-year term, and then who was gonna have the three-year term. We did that uh, a couple of COC meetings ago, and three people volunteered for a one-year term, and that was Stephen Keese, Larry Chu, and Carolyn Longstreth. Just because they volunteered for a one-year term doesn't mean they can't reapply for a second term because the, the, the way it was built, they can be um, a COC member uh, for two subsequent terms. Um, one of the goals is to, to create depth, create consistency, but also provide an opportunity for as many members of the public to be involved as possible. So um, the first one year term ends December 31st, 2021. And so I would like to begin the recruitment process November 1st, run it for a month. And that way we don't have to be rushed. 
at the next board meeting, I suggest um, having this as an action item, asking for a, um, a selection subcommittee, um, ad hoc subcommittee that could meet in December for review of the applications and then making a subsequent recommendation to the full board in the December meeting. And that allows for that member to be online in time for the first meeting in January, which would be their first meeting for that three-year term. And I suggest that we use the application that we used last year. Um, it was comprehensive and I, I, I believe it, it hit the information that we needed to get for this process. Yes. So I'm open to any questions. Uh, question from uh, directors? No, okay. Let me, let, me, let me do uh, add one thing. I did receive a great suggestion from Julie and for the staff report for the board meeting, I'll set up a table that shows the, the nine members which ones expire at what term. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, public comment, please. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, thanks. Back to the board. Any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, let's move on to item number nine, board of directors meeting agenda review. Mark, you're on again. Absolutely. I think it's going to be quick to discuss this. Um, we will make the change that we discussed earlier for the agenda order. And my recommendation for the educational item is since we are rolling out the website um, on the 21st, I recommend we make that our educational item because I would love the board to be uh, well informed of the resources that are in that website. So if their constituents ask them a question, the, the board member knows um, where they can point them to on our website. And I'm just going to say it again. I'm still so very excited about the website. It's coming out great. Wonderful. Thank but you. it will be a work in progress. Keep that in mind. It will be a work in progress. We are going to continue to improve it. Okay. Thank you, directors. Any questions? I'm seeing none. Public comment, please, Allison. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, great. Thanks. Any any further discussion? Um, Mark, just just quickly that we did talk about the educational item, and I think the website is a perfect idea. We had also previously agreed that we wanted to have uh, Ray Moritz uh, talk about wildfire history and, and implications, and then subsequently Danny Franco. Um, I guess the just keeping them on, you know notified that, that this is upcoming. And then um, just to, to be sure that we think about other topics that we would like presented to the, to the board for education. As it is, we have three months worth of educational <laughs> topics already lined out, but just keep put on your thinking cap. And what I like about Danny Franco piece, if we do that in November, um, it ties in with the website well, because we will be linking um, the website at some point to the, the work that Danny has been doing. So I think there's a good connection from one. Okay, yeah, question. it sounds like you're making that linkage. That's, that's perfect. Uh, no further discussion. Uh, let's move on to item nine. Uh, uh, committee members have uh, request any future agenda items, please. Oh, looks like we're on a roll. Um, well, and given that uh, at, uh, 11.34 on uh, October 7th, I'd like to adjourn the meeting. Really fantastic. Really great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good to see everybody. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Good job, Mark.